Well, hello, friends. I want to bring you greetings on this beautiful day and praise God for the gift of this day and for our opportunity to be in the Word together. All right, so we are going to finish off chapter 1. We're picking up at verse 43, so if you got your Bible, I want to invite you to join me there. All right, we'll dig in. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. So he's had an encounter with Philip, or Philip has, has joined the group that's kind of you know, hanging around Jesus, and Jesus makes the invitation personal. He says, come and follow me. Well, Philip has a response. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have the one Moses wrote about in the law and about the prophet, or about, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So I'll give you a little context here when we talk about the name Nathaniel. If you look at this, Nathaniel is not mentioned at all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, this is the only place outside of a reference very late in this gospel where it just says he was with the disciples. We're talking like resurrection time. It makes a reference to Nathaniel there. But this is the only place where we have any, any significant interaction with him, and it is, it is very momentary. We don't have any other account of Nathaniel by that name at least, but when we go into Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have another name that we believe is Nathaniel, and that is Bartholomew. Bartholomew is not a, a name of significance. It, it's not really a first name. Bar means son of, and so the image is that this is son of Tolme. So it's just like, you know, Barabbas, the son of Sabas, and so it's we, we have different images there that, that were used in the ancient world. And so when we think about Bartholomew, who is written about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it, it seems to be lining up with the image that Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same person. And one of the reasons we, know, we, we believe that is because Bartholomew is always found hanging with Philip. Whenever we, we see Philip, we see Bartholomew in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so here we have the, you know, the image of the friendship between Philip and Nathaniel. When Philip knows he's found, he's found the Messiah, he immediately he goes to Nathaniel and says, we, we found the Messiah, this is the one, he's just called me to follow him. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he makes reference to who this is. This is a Jesus, the one from Nazareth, who comes from Joseph's house. But Nathaniel's response is probably not what Philip was expecting. Because Nathaniel responds with, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And, you know, we respond to this like, what, what is Nathaniel's issue? Well, Nazareth was not a, it wasn't an evil town, it wasn't an awful town, it wasn't a town of ill repute, it wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. It's just that Nazareth was a town of no real significance. Um, whereas we, we know that, that Nathaniel actually came from Cana. And Cana, we're talking like maybe top three cities in, in the ancient world for, for the lands of the land of the Jews. So we, we have this image where, you know, Nathaniel's from Cana and he hears the Messiah is going to come out of Nazareth. And he's basically saying, are you kidding me? I mean, can anything good come out of there? I mean, that's, it's a nothing town. It's no, I mean, there's nothing of significance there. And we, we might be caught off guard by that. We might struggle with that. But I, I want to get us inside of there's nothing of significance that's ever come out of Nazareth. But again, then again, has there been anything of significance that people would have expected out of a peasant girl and a commoner? Or of a child that was born in a stable and laid in a manger? Or of a carpenter's son? Or of one who seemingly, you know, grew up as a good God-following, God-fearing young Jew but by the time he hit his late 20s, he'd really done nothing of significance. And now he begins this ministry and he begins to establish his messiahship. I, I think we have a lot of those questions, or we've seen a lot of those questions. We're, we're looking back in retrospect and, and trying to figure out why would Nathaniel respond this way, but most of the ancient world responded to everything about Jesus from his, his humble birth to his life, to even his ministry, in which he didn't gather this great following and go and take the Roman throne or, or try to uh, 
push off the authority of Rome in their region. No, instead he goes around as the, the humble Jesus who is healing, who is blessing, who is teaching, who is revealing the kingdom, who is... And so he doesn't quite fit the image of when you think about the Almighty God is going to send a Savior, a Messiah, to save his people. Now, they're thinking, what, like another one like Moses, who was a prince of Egypt, who God had placed in his position that he could ultimately lead the people out from captivity and into the land of promise? Maybe that's the image in their, in their heads. And Jesus just doesn't fit the image. So Nathaniel's response is, I think it fits. That's kind of the natural reaction. But I love Philip's response to Nathaniel because Philip in the end of verse 46 just says, come and see. Nathaniel, I'm not going to sit here and, and try to formulate arguments to convince you. Nathaniel, I'm not going to establish a series of proofs. Nathaniel, I'm not going to... Nathaniel, just come and see for yourself. Come and check it out. Figure out what you believe. Friends, Philip's model for how to witness and how to invite people to Christ is still valid today. It's still something that we can do. Sometimes people corner us and they're like, well, explain this or explain that or, or your scripture says this and it disagrees with this over here or I don't want to hear anything about this Jesus or the other side of, you know, I I feel like I'd like to get to know more about God. I, I almost, almost feel like there might be something there, but I just don't know. It just seems so unbelievable or whatever, whatever argument or whatever pushback people have. Our simplest answer is to say, come and, come and see. Come and check it out for yourself. There are so many things in this world that people will try. They'll, they'll, they'll give it a shot just to see if they enjoy it. I, I remember when I had a friend who said, you know, I, I want to invite you to come golf. My total experience with golf at that point was hitting a wiffle ball off a rubber mat in gym class in high school. And, and this, this now we're talking over a decade afterwards. And he's like, oh, golf is wonderful. I've been doing it for three years. And, and it just, it did not appeal to me. I don't want to watch it. I don't want to play it. I, it just wasn't, wasn't my thing. Well, he ultimately talked me into giving it a try one day. And I know, you know, you're going to go out to the golf range and you're going to, um, you know, you're going to do nine holes or 18 holes or whatever. And uh, it's going to take you a couple hours to, to go through that course. Um, so... You know, I went out there. I was willing to invest that time to just see. And then he talked me into it a couple more times. And then he talked me into joining the church golf league. So um, it, it was not my favorite thing. It's not something that I that I love to do. But it's something that I did enjoy. Uh, my skills got better as time went on. I enjoyed the fellowship of the group. I mean, that, that was good, just hanging out with them. And um, I enjoyed trying to make shots that they told me I couldn't make, which is probably not a good plan for golf, but, uh, yeah, that was kind of my approach. So <laughs> but anyway, um, his thing was basically, it was an approach to golf of just come and see, go, come and give it a try, come and invest a few hours of your time and see if you like it. We do that with a lot of things in life. And there are some things that you know, we try them, and sometimes we don't even get through the completion of them, and we just say, no, this is not for me. But there are other things that we, we come to find valuable in our life, or we come to enjoy. And if we invite somebody to come and explore Jesus, just come and check it out for themselves. If they're willing to try, on, try out so many other things in this world, why not at least give Jesus an opportunity? Why not at least, you know, create the space whether it's coming to worship or a Bible study or uh, you just getting together with them and spending time in prayer or sharing about your faith. What does it really cost us? If, we, if they find out, or what does it cost them, I guess is the question. If they find out that indeed this is the Messiah, then how blessed are they? If they find out the, the, the depth of God's love for them, how blessed are they? And if they don't connect, if they just turn away and, and, and just reject it again. They've only surrendered a few hours of their life. That's kind of what Philip did with Nathaniel. 
come check it out. You figure it out. If you like it, if you're good with it, if you believe he's the Messiah, I think you're going to want to follow him like I am. And if not, then I guess you'll go back to Cana and, and do your own thing. But Philip does not take it upon his shoulders to say, I have to formulate convincing arguments to get him in. He just says, come and see. I think we can take a lesson out of that book. It says, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. That's a pretty high piece of praise. Um, How do you know me, Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the, the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. What an incredible proclamation. And we don't have any more detail to this story to understand what turned Nathanael. What was it about Jesus knowing him? What's going on here that Nathanael just turns and immediately says, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Uh, I mean, this is an incredible proclamation. And the next time we hear a proclamation like this is when Peter utters it. And Peter utters it because Jesus looks at him and says, you know, you didn't figure this out for yourself. You didn't come to this conclusion on your own. The Father above revealed it to you that you would know. And yet we have very, right here in the beginning, in the very call, Nathaniel is saying, you're the one. I know it's true. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. Again, understanding the, the, the meaning of why, why that would be so significant to Nathaniel is beyond us. But we know that there was a dramatic impact here. And Jesus looks at him and he says, you will see things, greater things than that. Don't know what this means. There's a lot of explanations. If you, you may have a Bible that goes on and tries to articulate and explain, well, this is why, friends, that is a human insight to it. That is a conjecture of what it is. Uh, we have no definitive explanation of why this was so significant for Nathaniel. But it obviously just blow, it blows Nathaniel away. And then Jesus responds, you're going to see greater things than what you've just experienced. He's very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So, I mean, just a powerful way that God makes himself known in in our lives. And when we think about those that, that, you know, we encounter, that we have the opportunity to share the faith with, let Let's not be the people who allow our our witness to be stymied or to be held back because we're concerned about the response or because we don't feel like we have enough uh, biblical knowledge or foundation in our faith to formulate the kind of argument needed to convince somebody. It's not our job. It's Jesus' job. It's his call. Our, Our call is to introduce people. Our call is to just make the witness. And our call is to make the introduction to Jesus, that I I believe that this is the Messiah that guides my life. Friends, we don't know how it happened with Nathaniel. What we do know is that God loves every person, and God's desire is that all would come and live in relationship. And so we know that God is pursuing relentlessly every day those who don't yet know him, we are part of that process. We are, we are the instruments of delivering his message. We don't always understand how. Sometimes we'll be called to give a, a convincing argument, but it'll be an argument that, that we will know, that we will be able to be give, that we're equipped to give. Sometimes we'll be called to teach or to pray with somebody. Or, but again, it's, it's teaching that we'll be equipped for. It's understanding that we'll have. It's praying that, that we'll be ready to do because the Spirit will be leading us. And there are others who we just look at and say, come and see. I don't know how to give you the explanation. I only know what a difference it's made in my life. I know that as I've gotten to know Jesus, that it has made all the difference in how I face A and B and C and D. And I just wanna get to know him more every day. Because as I look back over the past, with every day I've gotten to know him better, my life has gotten better. My life has experienced more blessing. He has led me through so many trials, so many struggles, 
and led me to so many blessings and so many triumphs. So friends, let us walk in that way. Let us be like Philip, unafraid to just say, come and see. God bless you. Have a beautiful day and know that God loves you.